Hi, I'm Micah Halpern, and thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is, quite naturally, the war being waged between Israel and Gaza, Hamas. For Israel, this is not a war of revenge. This is not a war of retaliation. This is not tit for tat, not a cycle of violence. For Israel, this is a mission of self-defense. It is the defensive response. Israel's advance into Gaza is part of a Jewish state's larger mission of self-defense. Know this, remember this. The differences are foundational in understanding Israel's actions and behaviors. Israel has the responsibility of protecting its citizens, that's clear. Israel was attacked. Understanding the international laws of self-defense is essential. And the international laws of self-defense just happen to coincide with Jewish tradition and Jewish law on the issue of self-defense. Because Israel is now at war with Hamas in Gaza, Israel will be attacked by international media and by Jew haters, attacked for purely defensive actions against Hamas. Many of those attacks will be baseless, perpetrated by those who do not understand the meaning of self-defense. Self-defense does not simply mean that when you're attacked, you're permitted to fight back. It means much more. Self-defense permits a country to cross a border into another country to pursue the enemy that has attacked them. Self-defense includes cross-border preemptive strikes. It is not about who throws the first punch, especially if there is a pro provable plan to attack. Think back to the Six Days War. Israel was the first to strike, but Israel struck in a defensive preemptive attack against her enemy's air forces. The Talmud in Tractate Sanhedrin echoes this exact sentiment. When someone comes to attack you, you get up earlier and attack them first, preemptive strike. The Gemara actually uses the term, comes to kill you. A direct translation would be, when he comes to kill you, get up and kill him. This is the rabbinic version of the preemptive strike. Part of self-defense strike against Hamas is permission for Israel to hit Hamas hard enough that they will not attack Israel again. And that is the express purpose of Israel's war of iron swords and the IDF's actions against Hamas in Gaza. Over the next few weeks, enemies of Israel and Jew haters are going to use the media to attack Israel. They will be using terms like disproportionate force versus proportionate force and excessive force versus commensurate force. And while the attacks will be brutal, I can without hesitation guarantee that those saying Israel uses excessive disproportionate force will be wrong. Disproportionate force is not the Israeli way and proportionate force is not a literary term. Disproportionate force is not using a lot of force. It does not mean that if the attackers throw rocks at you, your only response can be to throw rocks back at them. That's not what it means. It does not mean that if the attackers use machine guns, you can only use uh, machine guns and not use planes and helicopters. Disproportionate force means that the party did not satisfy certain conditions while attacking. The central condition is whether they reasonably attempted to avoid civilian casualties when attacking their targets and whether their targets were real and responsible for the original attacks. Israel adds conditions of its own when targeting terrorists in the urban environments. As the entire world knows by now, Israel removes the element of surprise by dropping warning leaflets in Arabic telling locals to leave. It's a practice that they initiated years ago. They send Arabic text messages, SMS messages, to cell phones. Hamas, meanwhile, tells the citizens to stay put and even threatens them should they decide to vacate. One of the many ways in which Hamas turns average citizens into their human shields. Israel targets those responsible for past attacks and have acknowledged that they are actively planning future attacks. In this vein, Israel's declaration of war against Hamas 
is Israel's effort to prevent future attacks by Hamas against Israel. That's why it's not a war of revenge. That is what we call a defensive war. That is why Israel's war of swords, of iron, is a defensive war. Looking at it in another way, the operation becomes immoral and unjust otherwise. And that is how Israel's enemies and detractors will try to spin Israel's actions. But Israel's war against Hamas is a moral and just war. IDF rules of fighting are more moral than any other fighting force in the world. It bears repeating that Israel's fighters are not called Israel's army. They're not called Israel's military. They are the Israel Defense Forces. It is the only army in the world with that premonin. As an aside, for their part, the United States and the United Nations have targeted civilians. In June 1993, in Mogadishu, is but one example. On June 6th, under the UN, Pakistani soldiers opened fire, killing 23 civilians in Mogadishu. On June 18th, the New York Times reported that U.S. UN Cobra helicopters opened fire, killing 50 civilians and wounding 100. Hamas violently, brutally, savagely attacked and will continue to attack innocent civilians in Israel. The Hamas claim is that there is no such thing as an Israeli civilian, that all Israelis are settlers. The people under attack were living in communities, not settlements. They weren't in the West Bank. Hamas cares as little about the truth, as as little about international law as they care about the value of human life. Hamas only cares about Hamas. Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from Ynet. It was published on October 12th and was written by Giora Island. Island was the head of the Israeli National Security Council. He is a very thoughtful and tremendously experienced person in this area. The column is entitled, It's Time to Rip Off the Hamas Band-Aid, subtitled, Opinion. In the wake of recent events, Israel cannot be satisfied with any other goal than the elimination of Hamas in Gaza as a military and governing body. Anything less would be an Israeli failure. The subtitle encapsulates the entire column. This is how Island begins. The simple truth is that the writing was on the wall. Two months ago, I wrote that the historians who will write about 2023 will not believe what our leaders were engaged in, petty, almost despicable matters, when the writing was on the wall, and it was. In the wake of recent events, Israel cannot be satisfied with any other goal than the elimination of Hamas in Gaza as a military and governing body. Anything else would be an Israeli failure. For 20 years, Israel refrained from formalizing this goal. Now it is essential to define the strategies and understand the options. Island now explains that in order to solve the Hamas problem, four things must be done. He lays them out very clearly and very succinctly. He writes, in order for this to happen, Israel needs to demand four key points with greater determination than ever before. One, the entire population of Gaza will either move to Egypt or move to the Gulf. From our perspective, every building in Gaza known to have Hamas headquarters underneath, including schools and hospitals, is considered a military target. Two, every vehicle in Gaza is considered a military vehicle, transporting combatants. Therefore, there is no vehicular traffic, and it does not matter whether it is transporting water or other crucial supplies. Three, the United Nations Secretary General has initiated humanitarian aid to Gaza. The Israeli condition for any aid should be a visit by the Red Cross to Israeli hostages, and especially the civilians among them. Until this happens, no aid of any kind will be permitted to enter into Gaza. And finally, four, intermediators with both diplomatic and military experience will be required to explain in detail these concepts to the rest of the world. It will not be possible to remove Hamas without exerting pressure if the Americans do not receive a clear and detailed explanation from Israeli officials and understand that Israel has no choice. It is comparable 
to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which led to the launch of an atomic bomb in Japan. Island now concludes very simply, and it's clear to him as it is to many others. He writes, as a result, Gaza will become a place where no human being can exist. And I say this as a means rather than an end. I say this because there is no other option for ensuring the security of the state of Israel. We are fighting an existential war. This column was very powerful, and it is very sobering. I will add that Island is considered to be, and considers himself to be, a liberal and a leftist in Israeli politics. He supported the protests against Bibi and his government, and was ridiculed by the Prime Minister for it. As this column makes clear, in Israel, this is not an issue of right and left. It's an issue of survival. Next up is a column by Yuval Elbashan. It too was published in Why Not? This column was published on October 10th, 2023. It's entitled, The Blood-Soaked Earth Will Once Again Be Teeming with Life. Subtitled, Opinion, Our Adversaries Are Gravely Mistaken in Their Jubilation. In every point in history where Jewish blood has been spilled, we pulled through. Elbasham writes that Hamas and those who celebrate Hamas are simply wrong. He writes that this attack will not destroy Israel. It will make Israel stronger. This is how the column begins. Our adversaries are gravely mistaken. Perhaps they believe that by brutally severing our most beautiful blooms, we wilt like desert thistles. They overlook that we have been striking our roots in this tough soil for 3,000 years, 295 years, not even a million blood-soaked hoes of horrific kind they know proudly showcase online will manage to uproot us. Our adversaries are gravely mistaken. Perhaps they think that because we are a nation that profoundly sacrifices life, our story ends with death. It's true that unlike them, we steadfastly ensure our children experience every possible ounce of normal life. But it's precisely for that reason that death cannot defeat us. Forces bigger, stronger, and more malicious than theirs have tried and failed. Time and time again, even in this very region around the Gaza Strip. Yet here we remain, planting trees, fighting on the roads, and changing babies' diapers. Our adversaries are gravely mistaken. They seemingly presume that if they make us sufficiently miserable, we will retreat to our countries of origin, much like the British, French, and other foreigners who temporarily resided here for a few decades. Such ignorance. They don't understand that my family members who immigrated to Israel in 1890 felt their entire lives as though they were born here, while I and my generation, who were indeed born here, have always felt that we consciously chose to migrate here. Yes, we are all Israelis, both by birth and by choice. He now continues this theme, pointing out that throughout history, persecution against Jews has not succeeded. And he quotes Yehuda Amichai, the great Hebrew poet, who once said, Jews are not a historical people, nor merely an archeological one. They are a geological people with breaks, collapses, layers, and eruptions of molten lava. Their history ought to be gauged on a different scale. Elbashan explains that the murderous enemies of Jews will never understand this. He concludes his column writing, our adversaries are gravely mistaken in their current jubilation at the sound of shovels beginning to dig the graves of our heroes. They fail to comprehend that once we conclude covering our departed earth, those same shovels will be employed once more by us to dig holes for young saplings. These will be planted in memory of the fallen in the very places we have staunchly defended. Indeed, our adversaries have gravely mistaken but we must avoid our own errors amid the simmering anger, the numbing pain and substantial shock from the events of their unfolding. We must remember that the blood-soaked earth in Beri, Nachal Oz, Kfar Aza, Hulitz, and Sufa will once again be blanketed with vibrant carpets of flowers, 
on the lawn beside the dining hall in Kibbutz Berry, which currently bears several charred and spotty spots, children will once again play joyfully and their elders will grumble about their lively noise. In the same dining room, which will undergo several renovations, a gruff elderly man will stand during the members' meeting to lament that not enough of them attended the memorial service on the most recent Simchat Torah holiday. He'll express that it's a genuine pity because a people unaware of their past have no future. Most attendees at the meeting might not precisely recall the events of that ill-fated holiday and may dismiss his words, exchanging eye rolls with one another, silently signaling their weariness over the perennial issue that the same elderly man insists on raising each year. This last paragraph, by the way, is a tribute to the spectacular short story by Ephraim Hazaz. I'll explain that at another time in another episode. This column resonates with me. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to show you four cartoons and one meme today. They're all about Israel and Hamas. Some are biting, some made me chuckle. Humor and cartoons have begun to evolve a little bit since the war began. Uh, one week after the horrific massacre of 1,400 Jews, the cartoons were piercing, but not funny. Now the time has passed a little bit. The critique is still biting, but humor is emerging. This first cartoon has two panels. In the top panel, a Hamas terrorist is firing a, what looks to be an RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade. In the lower panel, the Hamas terrorist is celebrating because he hit the Israeli flag. Standing behind the RPG are civilians wrapped in the Palestinian flag. They and the flag are burning because of the blowback from the RPG. Next cartoon, we see people in hazmat outfits. They're speaking about the pandemic. One says, there's a new variant spreading. The second person says, no, this one's been around a long time. And the spore they're examining is, of course, anti-Semitism. This next cartoon depicts the destruction of a city. A roadway is divided. It has a border right down the middle. Israel's on one side and Gaza's on the other. On the Israel side, the family is holding a sign that reads, we are not Netanyahu. One of the Gaza side, the family is holding a sign and they say, we are not Hamas. This is so powerful and so true. All Gazans do not support Hamas. Actually, recent polls from there before the conflict show that the majority of Gazans don't support Hamas. Next up is a meme. It's of the famous crimson Harvard crest. The true Harvard crest reads veritas, which in Latin means truth. This new crest, however, reads death to Israel. Biting, very biting. This last cartoon also deals with Harvard. The press has covered Harvard student support for Hamas. In this cartoon, two faculty members are observing student demonstration. The demonstrator's sign reads, Harvard students for Hamas baby killers. One faculty member says to the other, maybe climate change isn't our biggest problem. The inability to differentiate between right and wrong is becoming a major problem on numerous campuses across America. Not just Ivy League campuses, many, many campuses. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi spoke with his Iranian counterpart. The minister from China said that Beijing will stand on the side of peace and justice and will support the Palestinian people in their just cause of preserving their national rights. Wang Yi also said that the main reason for what is happening now is the fact that the Palestinians' right to a state has been abandoned. And he claimed that this historical injustice must be put to an end as soon as possible. Of course, he also blamed the United States and Israel for all the problems going on right now. Colombian President Gustavo Petro took an aggressive stance against Israel following the bombings in the Gaza Strip. And he wrote on social media X, 
that, I'm quoting here, if we have to suspend relations with Israel, we will suspend relations. We do not support genocide, unquote. The Colombian ambassador to Israel was summoned for a reprimand following what Jerusalem termed the, quote, hostile and anti-Semitic statements of the president of Colombia against the state of Israel, unquote. As a further response, Israel decided to stop defense exports to Colombia. But Colombian President Petro was not impressed. And in his response, he wrote also on X, quote, one day the IDF and the government of Israel will ask us for forgiveness for what their people did in our country. I will hug them and they will cry over the murder in Auschwitz and Gaza and also over the Colombian Auschwitz, unquote. Very strange response from Colombia. Very strange. Absolving Israel from blame, IDF spokesperson for foreign media, Jonathan Konkrikus, accused Hamas of attacking a convoy that was evacuating people from northern Gaza Strip to the southern Gaza Strip, resulting in the killing of 70 civilians in the convoy. The IDF spokesperson said, we did not target any convoy of civilians, and we estimate that this attack was carried out by Hamas. When you think logically about who will benefit from these photos, you realize that only one organization, Hamas, we have already seen that there is no limit to its corruption. This is an organization of subhumans. I don't think they have a problem killing civilians if they think it will help them in the international arena. After the Human Rights Watch organization accused the IDF of using phosphorus bombs in their attacks in Gaza and Lebanon, the IDF spokesperson for foreign media, Jonathan Konkrikus, was asked by reporters what type of weapons Israel uses in attacks in the Gaza Strip. His unequivocal response was, we use weapons that meet NATO standards. We are committed to international law and generally try to use the lightest and most accurate weapons we have to hit specific targets. That was a very good response. In other words, no, Israel doesn't use phosphorus weapons. The Palestinian Authority's official news agency published comments by President Mahmoud Abbas that criticized Hamas over its actions, but later removed the reference to the terrorist group without providing an explanation as to why they removed it. The comments published on Wafa on its website were made during a phone call between Abbas and Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. The two discussed Israel's bombardment of Gaza following Hamas's deadly rampage through Israeli cities and villages. The original Wafa report on Abbas's call included the now-deleted line, the president also stressed that Hamas's policies and actions do not represent the Palestinian people. The policies, programs, and decisions of the Palestinian Liberation Organization represent the Palestinian people as their sole legitimate representative. That was a quote. Several hours later, the phrase was adjusted to read, the president also stressed that the policies, programs, and decisions of the PLO represent the Palestinian people as their sole legitimate representative and not the policies of any other organization. U.S. President Joe Biden said he is confident Israel will act under the rules of war in its conflict with Palestine and then added that deploying U.S. troops is not necessary. He said this in a 60 Minutes interview. Biden said that while he believes Hamas must be eliminated entirely, there must be a path for a Palestinian state. The U.S. president cautioned that the threat of terrorism in the United States had increased due to unrest in the Middle East. The U.S. Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, has announced that following the terrorist attack on Israel, Israelis with American citizenship will be eligible for tax relief and will be able to defer the payment of their U.S. taxes for a year. According to estimates by the U.S. State Department, there are more than 500,000 Israeli Americans with dual citizenship who will be eligible for the benefits. The IRS also announced that it will continue to monitor the events in Israel and that it may provide additional relief. Speaking at a visit to Jordan, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken 
said that everyone is determined to stop the spillover of conflict between Israel and the Palestinian terrorist group Hamas. Speaking to reporters, Blinken said, what I've heard from virtually every partner was a determination, a shared view, that we have to do everything possible to make sure this doesn't spread to other places. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that because the war with Hamas, the amount of volunteerism happening in Israel and the volunteerism by those who live outside of Israel, desperate to help in whatever they can, is staggering. Groups and individuals have sprouted up to help and help and help and help and help. This two and a half minute video clip runs through just some of the remarkable ways in which people are coming together to help, to show that we truly are one large, very large giving family. Talk about some of the cool and unique things that our people, Jews, are doing since the start of the war with Hamas. Veterinarians are locating and treating displaced domestic pets. Athletes are hosting basketball clinics for young kids, making sure that there's a bomb shelter nearby. Doulas are offering to stand by pregnant women whose husbands unexpectedly got called off to serve in the army. Yeshiva boys are stringing green tzitzit that are approved by the IDF for soldiers who want to start wearing. Bilingual educators from around the world are offering Zoom school for Israeli children whose parents and teachers just need a break. Men and boys are going door to door to offer families assistance in taking down their sukkah if their men or boys unexpectedly got called up to serve in the army. Party planners are offering assistance in expediting or downsizing weddings. Young girls and teens are offering to babysit or host camps for free so mothers could have time to themselves. Thousands of strangers are showing up to funerals of soldiers who just cannot have family there with them. Creatives are sharing crafts and other ways to keep kids busy at home. Restaurants are becoming fully kosher so that they could feed soldiers in the army. Cell phone companies are offering unlimited use to their customers at no additional charge. Coffee shops are offering free food and drink to anyone in a military uniform. Women are cooking gluten-free food for soldiers who have celiac disease. Car dealerships are offering vehicles for soldiers who need to report to base to serve. Women who have recently given birth are offering breast milk for babies who no longer have mothers. Thousands of families are offering to host displaced people indefinitely. Boys are stocking grocery shelves because the employees are serving in the army. Kids selling cotton candy, and instead of taking payment, you say Perak of Tehillim. Airline tickets are fully paid for for men and women internationally who want to return to Israel to serve in the army. Food being delivered to women who are alone at home with many children. Free therapy for anyone who's struggling with their mental health right now. Everyone should, of course, continue all of the fundraising efforts and support. Continue sending duffel bags full of basic necessities and military gear. Ceramic bulletproof vest plates, underwear, socks, tampons, solar-powered phone chargers, clothes, food, toys, medical gear, and medications. I just wanted to share some of the creative ways people are helping. I shouted from the rooftops about what an incredible nation we are. I'm Israel Chai. Let me know what else you've been seeing around the world. Anything that's going to help our soldiers, our families, our Jews, our citizens. Anything that you've seen that's absolutely incredible, share it in the comments below, and please share this video. It was downright inspirational. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.